Hello everyone and welcome to lecture 6. This is on smooth muscle and the autonomic nervous system. Okay, so to begin, uh, just to remind you guys that, you know, in the previous lecture we talked about skeletal muscle. And so smooth muscle will have many similar characteristics. For instance, it is excitable, uh, it does contract and relax, right? Um, however, there are a lot of differences. So for example, uh, smooth muscle is called smooth because it lacks striations. If you recall, striations in skeletal muscle, and as you'll see in cardiac muscle as well, means that it has myofibrils that have repeating units of sarcomeres with the Z-discs and so on. And so they had those uh, A-bands and I-bands which made up their dark and light pattern that you can actually see in a microscope. Smooth muscle is called smooth because it doesn't have those striations. It doesn't have myofibrils, uh, so it will lack that, that pattern. And, um, you know, these are smaller cells, which vary greatly in size from each other, okay? So they're, you know, will be larger and smaller smooth muscle cells, depending on which organ they're in. Uh, they have a single nucleus, and more or less, most of them have this sort of spindle shape, or as I call it, like a football shape, all right, but much thinner. And so um, they also have less myosin overall. They do contain myosin, because that's partly how they're going to contract but just in uh, comparison to skeletal muscle, it's a lot less. They do not, however, have any troponin. So that's what we learned in skeletal muscle was one of the regulators for contraction was calcium binding to troponin to remove the tropomyosin in order to reveal the actin binding sites so that we could have our contraction cycle occur. There is no troponin in smooth muscles. All right, uh, the calcium actually binds to something else. It binds to calmodulin. And that'll create a chain reaction, which we'll discuss in a, in a few slides. Uh, they don't have Z-discs. So like I said, you don't see that banded pattern of striations. So they lack Z-discs. Instead, um, the thin filaments or the actin is really bound to something called a dense body. And the dense body, you can actually see in the cartoon here, they look like little beads on the surface. You can see the little beads over here. All right, so you can see that on the surface, you'll see the actin is actually bound to those dense bodies. Now the dense bodies uh, not only anchor the actin, but they also help to anchor the smooth muscle to the extracellular matrix, as well as to other smooth muscles. So it's a good anchoring protein. Uh, and again, uh, anchoring it to the extracellular matrix means it has, you know, uh, when it contracts, it'll make, um, it'll form some sort of tension with the surrounding tissue. Uh, as well as binding to other smooth muscles. Smooth muscle is involuntary, right? So skeletal muscle we, we kind of understand as being more voluntary. Um, and in terms of smooth muscles responsiveness, it's actually um, can be regulated by many more things than skeletal muscle is. So for example, in skeletal muscle, you had a, a motor neuron Right, so you have a somatic motor neuron that innervates a single muscle cell and it releases acetylcholine. And the only thing that occurs to the, uh, the only thing that happens with the skeletal muscle when it's stimulated is it excites the skeletal muscle and it contracts. We remove the calcium, then the muscle can relax and wait for the next signal. So it's only an excitatory stimulus and it only responds to the nerve, the neuron. It doesn't respond to any other chemical mediators or stretch or anything like that. It's only the neuron. Smooth muscle, on the other hand, is much more dynamic. It responds to a host of different things, which include the nervous system, of course. Uh, it, it responds to things like stretch. For instance, you have smooth muscle in your bladder, so as that starts to fill up and stretch, it can respond in kind to that. Uh, it responds to chemicals. And by chemicals, I mean, uh, for example, like a hormone uh, can respond to epinephrine, which is adrenaline, uh, and cause changes, right? Uh, temperature. Uh, you notice this on a, on a cold day, for example, you know, the skin can become paler as the blood constricts, particularly in distal extremities, like in your fingertips and toes. Uh, so as the blood vessels, the smooth muscle in the blood vessel walls constrict, uh, it reduces blood flow to those area, to those areas. That comes across as looking kind of palish, okay? Um, but it's responding to the temperature outside and helps to conserve warmth towards your core because the constricting peripheral vessels will shunt blood towards the organs in your body and so on and towards the core of your body.
Um, the calcium, it requires calcium for contraction, just like skeletal muscle. And uh, primarily that calcium is going to come from the ECF, all right, the extracellular fluid. However, uh, you know, some of the smooth muscle cells do have a, a smooth endoplasmic reticulum, uh, which, you know, will, will play a role in some smooth muscle. There's also what we call a slow sustained contraction. So overall, and this goes back to the, um, the speed of contraction diagrams that I showed you in the skeletal muscle lecture, uh, in that once you've actually initiated the contraction of a smooth muscle, it takes much longer than, say, skeletal muscle to actually form the contraction. Uh, and that has to do with the kinetics of you know, the myosin binding to the actin, which I'll get into. Uh, but this slow sustained contraction also means that it can create more tension than skeletal muscle can. So it, it can actually uh, uh, produce more tension than skeletal muscle, as well as maintain that tension over long periods of time while using very little energy. So it's, it's quite efficient. And this is very useful in our bodies, as we'll see, for maintaining tone or tension uh, in the muscle walls of the organs of our body that need to be maintained all the time. Like for instance, in our blood vessels to help us maintain our blood pressure. If we were to lose the tone in our blood vessels, all right, our blood pressure would drop precipitously. And of course, we wouldn't survive that. We would refer to that as, you know, uh, shock, for example, right? Um, so we'll get more into that later. So before I move on here, just to kind of bring you over to this cartoon again, this is just showing you in the relaxed state versus the contracted state. And you'll notice that uh, you have sort of this, I want to say random pattern, but uh, you do not. You definitely don't have the same pattern that you saw in the skeletal muscle, but you can see where these dense bodies are. You see the yellow, which is the actin, and the blue, which is the thick filament or the myosin. And when it contracts, the whole thing kind of scrunches together like that, as you're seeing there. And of course, once it's bound to the extracellular matrix or other smooth muscles, they would all be doing sort of the same thing. So here's just showing you a little bit of the anatomy here. Over here, this is a reminder that in the arteries you have layers to them. And this should be familiar to you, especially after the capillary lecture, uh, where the, you know, in the lumen, which is the central portion right here, you have the endothelial cells that line the lumen there. And then, uh, which we refer to as the intima, it's the most intimate portion that's next to the, the blood. And then in, this, uh, in the media there, which is usually the thickest portion, you have smooth muscle smooth muscle which surrounds the circumference of the of the blood vessel all right and, and, and then you have the externa which is you know the outer tissue there now if you take a look at the smooth muscle in that uh, middle section of the, of the blood vessel there you can see here that sort of spindle like shape very very thin and you can see the single nucleus and so on now smooth muscle as I said it, it responds to a whole host of different uh, mediators which means that um, it's far more dynamic in its responsiveness of what it can do. And it can actually contract and hold for longer. So smooth muscle is very interesting and, and very diverse, actually, uh, when, when comparing it to something like skeletal muscle or cardiac muscle. Now, um, in skeletal muscle, we had you know, a somatic motor neuron that made a connection, a direct connection to a skeletal muscle cell. And we refer to that as the neuromuscular junction okay uh, however in smooth muscle there's no direct connection with a neuron okay so the way it works we have what we call autonomic neurons which we're going to learn more about at the end of this lecture but autonomic neurons not uh, somatic motor neurons which is what innervates skeletal muscle the autonomic uh, neurons they contain what we call varicosities so actually, if we look over here at the cartoon, all right, you can see uh, it's, it tells you an autonomic, autonomic nerve fiber right here, which is really just the, the axon. And you see the axon actually divides several times, okay? And then you see these swellings here all along that, kind of looks like beads on a string again. It's those beads on a string. Those are, those are actually our terminals. So unlike with the somatic motor neuron, where the axon would terminate at the, the terminal and you'd actually you'd just release the uh, neurotransmitter there directly onto a single skeletal muscle cell. What you have here instead is you have multiple sites there, which, which we refer to as the varicosities. And if you look, if we 
zoom in on the varicosity over here, here's one of them, you actually have vesicles that are stored in each one of those varicosities. So as the action potential moves along from varicosity to varicosity, it causes release of the stored neurotransmitter in those varicosities. And just like we spoke about in skeletal muscle as well, uh, and in the nervous system lecture, uh, each neuron would only contain one type of neurotransmitter. So even though it has multiple varicosities, they would all be releasing the same neurotransmitter. Okay. Uh, and again, that, that could be you know, excitatory or inhibitory inputs to the smooth muscle. So it could be releasing something like uh, acetylcholine or norepinephrine, which are the examples I gave here. Right? Norepinephrine, which is actually found in what we call the sympathetic nervous system, which is a part of the autonomic nervous system or acetylcholine, which is part of the parasympathetic nervous system. So those are sort of the two parts of the autonomic nervous system, and they sort of counteract each other. Uh, typically, they have opposite actions uh, when it comes to the organs and what they'll do. So for example, if, if norepinephrine will cause contraction of the smooth muscle, acetylcholine would cause relaxation of the smooth muscle. All right. And so when this neurotransmitter is released, it's not released onto a particular site or like an end plate like you see in the skeletal muscle. Instead, it's sort of just diffused and it's much far, further away. So it diffuses into that site and can interact with multiple uh, smooth muscle cells uh, and their receptors. Now, another interesting thing about smooth muscle, uh, unlike skeletal muscle, is that smooth muscle can actually undergo mitosis and so therefore it can undergo hyperplasia. So we can increase the number of smooth muscles. A good example of that is during pregnancy in the uterus. As the uterus becomes larger because the fetus is getting larger, uh, smooth muscle will actually divide and uh, undergo hyperplasia. It can also undergo hypertrophy, so they can also become larger. The cell, single cells themselves can become larger as well. Now, in terms of the arrangement of smooth muscle, uh, remember that smooth muscle with both the viscera or the organs in our body uh, have some type of functional role, obviously. And so their, their layout within the organ uh, plays a role in their functioning. So as an example, if you take uh, right here, we have the stomach. So here's the esophagus right there, which is what they're showing you, kind of blown up here. That's a cross section through the esophagus. And so if you look at the inner lining there, it looks like basically if you imagine a hollow tube that's collapsed on itself, it's kind of collapsed. And so what you're looking at here, the purple lining right there, is the epithelium that lines the lumen, which is actually the white area in the middle there. So it's not a nice circular open or patent uh, lumen there. In, start, in fact, it's kind of collapsed on itself, which is typical for the esophagus. All right, and uh, you'll notice that out here, what I really want to draw your attention to is this layer right here and this layer that's just deep to it there. Those are both smooth muscle layers. That outer, those outer two rings, if you will. The outermost layer, all right, is actually what we refer to as a, a longitudinal layer. And the longitudinal layer means that if I have a hollow tube, all right, if this is the whole hollow tube, it runs the length of the tube. So it runs along the length parallel with the, with the tube. And so you can imagine that if I have a longitudinal muscle, if it were to contract, it would scrunch the tube up like an accordion. All right, we can scrunch that up. And that's useful, especially if we have something in our digestive tract that we want to propel forward. We can scrunch it up and kind of move it down uh, in the direction we want. But we also need another layer of smooth muscle that runs in a different direction, which we call the circular layer. And so that's the layer that you just deep to that outermost layer. And you can see the circular layer running there. And so that runs around the circumference all right, so it's aligned around the circumference of that, uh, of the digestive tract there. And what that serves to do is anytime we have circumferential muscle, anytime it constricts, it's going to make the lumen smaller. Okay, it's going to make the lumen smaller. And anytime it relaxes, it's going to what we call dilate. So the lumen will become larger. And that also serves a purpose. So for example, again, in the digestive tract, if it were to constrict just above, let's say, a bolus of food in the esophagus, and then the longitudinal contracts, it's going to be able to push or sort of milk the food into the stomach. So there's a coordinated reflexive action that's going to take place. Uh, and we refer to some of this type of movement as like peristalsis, which we're going to come back to in, in the GI lectures. But this is really just to kind of show you how we have different alignment of the smooth muscles so that we can, you know, create different types of movement, for example.
Now, as I said before, smooth muscle is very diverse uh, and responds to a whole host of different things. And so what we do is we kind of broadly categorize them into two things. Uh, we call it multi-unit or unitary or single unit. So multi-unit or single unit. Now, in multi-unit, which is the first example I have here, uh, the individual cells can actually have like their own autonomic nerve connection. It's not a neuromuscular junction like we saw with skeletal muscle, but it would be you know one that just basically, as you see over here, is a single cell not connected to the other smooth muscle cells, and the varicosities, would, when they release their neurotransmitter, would have to activate that single cell. As you can see, all these smooth muscle cells are basically independent of each other. And so we call that multi-unit. And so that means that the neuron, if it releases a neurotransmitter, has to activate, in some cases, you know, uh, one or several smooth muscles at a time. And uh, that would allow for, say, fine-tuned movement or something, something we might see in, say, the iris of the eye, where it could be a much more uh, graded response. Okay, so anytime we can, you know, basically it's, it's, it's very similar to, say, a motor unit in what, that we talked about in the skeletal muscle, where you have a single neuron activating, you know, anywhere from two or three skeletal muscle cells up to thousands. Uh, this is similar in, in that regard. So you could have a single neuron uh, activating two or three or more smooth muscles. The smaller the unit, of course, the, the more control, the more fine-tuning you can do. Now, uh, the couple of things to, to mention with that is they, first off, they don't fire spontaneously, okay, which means they don't fire action potentials automatically, which you'll see some, some of them can. Uh, and they do not uh, con uh, contract in response to stretch, which is a characteristic of many smooth muscle cells. So if they were to be stretched, like in the example I gave with the bladder, uh, if these were multi-units in the bladder, it would not actually respond to that stretch. So obviously the ones in the bladder are not multi-unit. Now, uh, the viscera, or the organs, really, most of the organs, are right, they're usually most of what we're going to be talking about are going to be single unit. That's the most abundant. So with single unit, they basically all act as a single unit, which is why we call them that. Even though there's multiple smooth muscle cells here, you'll notice they're connected via these gap junctions here, as well as desmosomes that help keep them kind of locked together. And uh, they'll contract as a unit. So uh, just as I talked about electrical uh, synapses, this will respond very quickly. You'll notice that the neuron varicosities don't have to sort of intertwine between all the neurons and hope to make sure they activate certain ones. Instead, it's just going to bathe a layer of smooth muscle cells in neurotransmitter, and that's going to result in activation of a few of them, and that activation will then spread through the rest of them. And so that can activate a, you know, a whole large number of smooth muscle cells effectively simultaneously. And that's useful, for example, in, say, the digestive tract again, where, in fact, you do have pacemaker, what we call pacemaker cells. What that means is that some of those smooth muscle cells can actually spontaneously depolarize. And when they do that, they can activate all the ones they're connected to. You see the same thing in the heart. Pacemaker cells in the heart that activate, they can depolarize cardiac muscle cells that are all connected via gap junctions as well. So it's going to act as a unit. That's going to allow sections of, say, the, the digestive tract to contract and constrict, which is far more useful than trying to kind of fine-tune moving you know, particles of food through your digestive tract, which would be very difficult. Um, so again, uh, act as a unit, and then they can be spontaneously active, as I mentioned. So again, in, like the pacemaker cells. But they would be, of course, specialized cells. Most of them are not going to be spontaneously active, but you would get a cluster of cells that are specialized in that. And then these are the groups that can actually contract in response to stretch. So things that you would see in the digestive tract or the bladder, for example, when stretched, uh, can constrict in response to it. Now, as I mentioned already, there's a whole um, array of different ways to excite or activate smooth muscle. And so the first one I talked about is the nerves, so autonomic nerves, parasympathetic and sympathetics. And there are neurotransmitters, which are norepinephrine and acetylcholine, which actually can excite or inhibit the smooth muscle, which is, you know, different already from skeletal muscle, which can only be excited. Uh, the chemicals, hormones like CO2, uh, excuse me, hormones, CO2, oxygen, nitric oxide, even a low pH, these can all trigger a response from smooth muscle cells. They have specialized receptors that uh, allow them to respond to these things. Skeletal muscle does not have that.
uh, temperature, right? We mentioned temperature before, give that example. Stretch as well as we already mentioned. And if you take a look at the cartoon here, this is just to kind of illustrate uh, the, the possible ways that we can activate. And when we say activate, really what we're saying is that all these, this host of different things to kind of trigger the smooth muscle means to either allow for the entry of calcium into the cell so contraction can occur, or to inhibit the entry of calcium into the cell, so to prevent contraction. So we take a look, you could have something called a leak channel where calcium can kind of gradually go in. You might see that in like a pacemaker cell, which can actually depolarize the cell automatically. Okay, so calcium might just leak in very gradually and ultimately de depolarize these pacemaker cells and then I'll send the signal out to all the rest of those unitary smooth muscles that are attached to it. Voltage gated uh, calcium channels. So this may have, uh, you know, this may be triggered by again, sort of you know, neurotransmitter response and so on, uh, secondary to this ligand gated channel. So for example, norepinephrine binds to uh, this this channel here opens up the calcium channel and that can also trigger voltage-gated channel changes uh, Or this could just be voltage-gated channel that's connected to the leak channel So in any case it's depolarized. It'll open up a calcium channel calcium can come in uh, A ligand gated channel could be you know any particular hormone or neurotransmitter that opens up a calcium channel stretch activated it's just basically from distortion of the membrane causes the, the mechanical stretching or distortion of that membrane to open up the channel and allow calcium in. So we call that stretch activated. So those are all numerous ways in which calcium can come in from the ECF, as well as over here, where you can have a receptor where now you have the agonist binds to it and initiates a cascade internally inside the cell, which we refer to as a metabotropic type signaling as opposed to an inotropic type signaling, which you see with the ligand gated channel over here. And so what I would draw your attention to here is in the metabotropic signaling, it can signal an increase in IP3, which is a second messenger. IP3 can diffuse into the cell and of course, open calcium channels that are located in the sarcoplasmic reticulum of smooth muscles. This will allow calcium that's stored in the sarcoplasmic reticulum to move into the cyto cytoplasm and increase concentration there. And the last piece I want to show, uh, draw your attention to is the calcium that's coming into the smooth muscle. That calcium itself can actually activate calcium release from the sarcoplasmic reticulum through specialized channels. We call that calcium-induced calcium release. It's something you see in smooth muscle. It's something we're going to come back to for cardiac muscle. All right. So again, primarily what we're going to do, see though is calcium coming in from the ECF. That's the main source. Some of the smooth muscle cells, however, will activate that sarcoplasmic reticulum and release calcium in that manner. In terms of getting rid of the calcium, once it's accumulated in the cytoplasm, it can't stay there, so it gets pumped out back into the ECF using uh, a calcium ATPase. Or you can use take advantage of the sodium-potassium pump. And since sodium is in high concentration in the ECF, thanks to that pump, sodium wants to go down its gradient inside the cell. So therefore, while it goes down, we're going to use the energy coming from that sodium moving down its gradient to pump calcium out against its gradient. So we call it the cal sodium calcium exchanger. All right. And then lastly, you have here the calcium ATPase located in the sarcoplasmic reticulum to pump any calcium back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So this is really just an illustration of the myriad of ways that calcium can enter and also leave the cell. Now the next question is, once you have calcium entering into the cytoplasm, what is the mechanism of contraction? We know that the players are essentially the same. Essentially, it's not the same structure though. We don't have Z-discs and so on, but we still have actin and myosin. And so we know that myosin heads are going to bind to the active site on actin, right? But there are some key differences from skeletal muscle. As I mentioned earlier already, there is no troponin and tropomyosin complex. All right, so actin does not have any of that bound to it. There's no, none of that regulatory, none of the regulatory proteins that play that role. Instead, when calcium enters the uh, smooth, uh, smooth muscle, either through any of those channels that I mentioned before, when calcium comes in, it's going to bind to calmodulin. All right, so it binds to calmodulin. Once calcium binds to calmodulin, that complex of calcium and calmodulin can then activate myosin light chain kinase. 
just as a reminder, a kinase is something that's going to phosphorylate something else or add a phosphate group to it. So in this case, that kinase, that myosin light chain kinase is going to phosphorylate a regulatory protein on the myosin neck. And if you recall, myosin has kind of a golf club shape where it has a, a, a tail and then a little bit of a neck and then the head over here. So this would be the neck region. All right. And so those are where the myosin light chains are located, or in that neck region. So once we have this complex, this calcium calmodulin myosin light chain kinase complex, which you see over here in the cartoon, it's going to phosphorylate the neck. So let me draw that for you here. So I'm going to add uh, an attachment to that. I'm just going to put a little P with a circle around it to indicate that it was phosphorylated. So calcium comes in, makes that complex, and now it's able to phosphorylate the neck of the myosin. The, when it does that, all right, it's going to activate the myosin ATPs. If you recall from the skeletal muscle lecture, this, the head of the myosin contains in it uh, a myosin a, uh, excuse me, an ATPase. And if you recall, that means that ATP is going to bind to the head of myosin, and it's going to hydrolyze it. And once it hydrolyzes, it puts into a cocked position, which can then interact with the actin uh, active sites. So in this case, this complex of the myosin light chain kinase phosphorylates the neck, which activates the ATPs, meaning that it increases the affinity in the head for that ATP, so it can then bind to it and then become hydrolyzed and put it into the cocked position, so it can go through the cycle which we reviewed in skeletal muscle. It's the exact same thing. So as soon as that neck is phosphorylated, that turns on the ATPase. ATP will have a high affinity for it. It'll get cleaved. It'll have ADP and phosphate bound to the head. So you'll have, again, you'll have your ADP and phosphate group bound to the head there. It'll be the cock position. Actin has already has an exposed site. It'll bind to it, and, it can, and it'll go through that cycle where it binds, where it form a cross bridge. It'll go through the power stroke, where it will release the ADP and the, P and the phosphate. And then ATP will then bind to it again to release it, and it will reset. And it'll go through the exact same motion of that contraction cycle that we talked about in skeletal muscle. But the big difference here is no troponin or tropomyosin. Instead, you have to use the myosin light chain kinase to turn on the myosin. Okay? This phosphate down here, which I'll circle blue here, this right here, the one that binds to the neck, is merely the regulator. It's no longer troponin. That's the regulator that turns on the myosin to allow it to go through that contraction cycle. Once it's turned on, it behaves exactly like we've, we've learned previously. Okay? So then actin uh, will then pull on those dense bodies. So our myosin binds to the actin, pulls on it, and when it does that, the actin is bound to the dense bodies, which scrunches up that whole smooth muscle. All right? Now, going on at the same time here, which I didn't draw in, is that, of course, to relax it, you'd actually have to remove the calcium. Once the calcium is removed from that complex, the complex can no longer keep the myosin phosphorylated, all right, because what you have working here is a phosphatase, and the phosphatase will then remove the phosphate group when calcium is being removed. And so the myosin will then turn off. So this is a little bit of a review of the things I've just been discussing. In fact, this drawing right here comes from the, the notes that I give you guys. So the sources of the calcium, uh, of course, they come from the ECF primarily, and again, through voltage-gated, ligand-gated, or stretch receptors, and so on. You can get a little bit from sarcoplasmic reticulum. Uh, again, some of the mechanism for that would be via the metabotropic receptors, uh, second messenger, IP3, or from calcium-induced calcium release. And so you can see that in the cartoon over here. It's just showing you voltage-gated calcium channels here. It's showing you a G-protein coupled receptor that's increasing IP3 and releasing calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. All right, that's just some examples there. And you can see here, this is where the calcium concentration is increasing. As calcium is increasing, it's binding with calmodulin, which is activating the myosin light chain kinase. This complex forms and converts myosin into phos uh, phosphorylated myosin, remember it's phosphorylating that neck region. And in the presence of ATP, of course you're going to need energy for this, in the presence of ATP you're going to go through that uh, 
cross bridge and power stroke cycling that we've learned about uh, with the actin. And we refer to that as phasic contraction. That's the typical type of contraction that we've learned about. Um, my light just blinked out. So that's that phasic contraction we've learned about that's very similar to skeletal muscle. And here's the phosphatase down here. As calcium gets resequestered, so you see it over here, all right, calcium is being moved out of the cyto cytoplasm via calcium pumps, those ATPases, uh, or the sodium calcium exchanger. So we're getting that out of the cytoplasm there. You also have a calcium pump on the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which wasn't drawn here. Um, and then the phosphatase, phosphatases are always working. It's just they're overpowered when a lot of calcium comes in, and it can't keep up with the myosin light chain kinases activity. But phosphatase is basically working at a low level the whole time. It's just as the calcium gets moved out of the cell, myosin light chain kinase loses a lot of its activity, and phosphatase kind of wins out, if you will. And so the balance shifts towards phosphatase activity. It removes that uh, phosphate from the myosin, and we go back to just our regular myosin, which is really in a state of inhibited readiness, okay, until, the next, until it becomes phosphorylated again and it can go through the cycle. We'll talk about this down here on the next slide here. This is tonic contraction. And uh, we refer to this as the, the latch bridge mechanism. And this latch bridge mechanism is really vital to how smooth muscle can actually uh, contract and maintain tone. Our maintain tone in our, our blood vessels, our digestive tract, and so on, where it can actually maintain some level of tension for prolonged periods of time without using much energy. So it's very, very efficient. So again, this tonic contraction, we refer to as that latch bridge mechanism. All right. This is a, a fatigue resistant type mechanism. So like I said, it's maintaining a high level of tone with, use, with very little energy. So let's, let's see how that's done. So this is a very old cartoon, but let me explain what's happening here. So at stage one, all right, what you're seeing over here is the myosin. All right, you can see the, the neck of the myosin. All right, and there's the head. Here's the head. All right. And this up here is the actin. And as you already know, uh, in a relaxed state, the myosin head is not bound to the actin, so there's no tension. All right, so there's no tension at this point. Now there's an influx of calcium. All right, so calcium comes in, binds to calmodulin, which is that, and that forms a complex with myosin light chain kinase, which is the MK, which you see there. And so that whole complex, okay, that whole complex now phosphorylates the neck, which turns on the myosin, as I've spoken of. All right, so once it's turned on, it can now bind and interact with the actin and undergo what we uh, relatively fast cycling, which is that whole complex of cross bridge formation, power stroke, and then when ATP binds to it, releases it again, gets hydrolyzed, goes back into a cock position, binds to the actin in a different location, and then goes cross bridge, um, power stroke, and repeat and repeat. And it'll do that so long as the calcium level remains high there and there's enough ATP. It'll continue to do that cycle. Um, now, that's why I'm showing you here uh, with the ATP and the phosphates being used, uh, being used up, but that's being used up by the head. Now, the ATP is that's located in the myosin head to create the cross bridge and the, contra uh, the power stroke. So you can see here, now it's bound there and contracting. Now, imagine a scenario here where, as the calcium leaves, all right, so we had an influx of calcium, and that's producing our contraction cycling, as we know, all right? If we sequester the calcium and remove it from the cytoplasm, so it's going back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum, we're pumping it back out to the extracellular fluid, that calcium level is dropping, that means the myosin, uh, myosin light chain kinase level is starting to decrease, and phosphatases are taking over, and the phosphatase can remove that phosphate from the neck and turn off the myosin. Now, if it removes it um, when the myosin head is um, attached to the actin, so for example, it, it's formed a cross bridge, all right, and then it went through the power stroke. And remember, when the when uh, the myosin goes through the power stroke, it releases ADP and phosphate, and it has to wait for another ATP to bind to the head before it can be released and then recocked. Now, if you imagine that we've gone through the power stroke, and then you remove the phosphate from the neck, so it's still attached to the actin, 
All right, so that's what this uh, point three here is trying to point out to you here, is that we have a myosin head that's bound. It's already gone through the power stroke. It still has its phosphate there. It's waiting for another ATP to come along so it can release the myosin head from that actin. But instead, the phosphatase here removes that phosphate group. You notice there's no phosphate group over here anymore. It removes that phosphate group. And so what ends up happening is now you have this myosin head bound to the actin waiting for ATP to come along. The phosphatase remove that, uh, that phosphate group from the neck, turning it off. If you recall from the previous slide, I said that phosphorylating the light chains in the neck is what activates the ATPs. It increases its affinity for ATP. So by removing the phosphate while it's still bound to actin, it means that it's going to have lower affinity for ATP while it's still bound to the actin. So remember, I can't release that myosin head from the actin unless ATP binds to that, that ATP is. But now I remove the regulatory phosphate group from the neck, which basically shut off my ATPase and lowered the affin affinity significantly. So therefore, myosin, the myosin head stays bound to the actin, despite the fact that there may be ATP present, because it's not going to bind to it and it can't be released. So just like in the skeletal muscle example where that would cause like rigor mortis, for example, in a post-mortem right, patient, uh, in this case, our smooth muscles can actually utilize that by turning off the myosin as it's bound to actin, it remains and holds on to that tension because it's still holding on to actin in a contracted state. And now it reduces its affinity while it's in a contracted state, so acting so the ATP can't release it from that uh, from that actin. So it stays, it holds on to that tension, and it, it maintains it for a long period of time. And that helps to keep the tension in the smooth muscle, and it's not utilizing ATP any longer, so therefore it's low energy. So in fact, this mechanism helps to reduce energy consumption all right, and maintain the tension. And all it had to do was remove that regulatory phosphate group from the light chain while it was still bound to actin. And so it can help keep tone in the blood vessels, the digestive tract, and so on. And so this is a great way to maintain tension while not consuming too much energy. Because if we didn't have this mechanism, we would have to consume a lot more energy than we, we currently do. All right, so now we're talking about the autonomic nervous system. All right, so I've already kind of alluded to this when I talked about, or I mentioned it in the previous slides, um, when I said that the smooth muscle is innervated by the autonomic nervous system. And there were two parts, there was the parasympathetic and the sympathetic. And for the most part, they have opposite actions on the organs that they innervate. All right, so example here, what you can see is, um, you see the pupil right there? Uh, you, you notice it's really it's the iris controlling it around it, but it's what you're seeing is a constriction right there and then dilation. It constricts again and dilates, and it does that in response to light. So again, if you're in a dark room and you want to increase the amount of light hitting the retina, it's going to dilate or get wider like that. And if you shine a light in the person's eye, it will constrict. And this is an effect that you can see very clearly, um, you know, if you have a pen light or something like that uh, in a dark room. You can, you can see the effect uh, very well. It's also easier to see in people who have, uh, you know, lighter iris colors. All right, but this is, again, this is a responsiveness of the autonomic nervous system, and it carries out many different reflexes uh, within the body. And uh, in this case, the dilation, or the pupil getting larger to let in more light, uh, is a sympathetic response, and then the parasympathetic response would be the opposite, which is to constrict it. So this is being regulated by the two different portions of the autonomic nervous system. So here are the two parts, and so this is sort of a breakdown of, of overall kind of functionality of the, uh, the nervous system, which I've already kind of reviewed a little bit in the nervous system lecture. But you have, again, you have central versus peripheral, which we went over. But then you have the afferent and efferent. So, so I like this breakdown. Where the afferent, if you recall, that's bringing information to the central nervous system, to the spinal cord or to the brain. Okay. Now, that can be somatic or visceral. So somatic, soma means body, right? So somatic is really just talking about uh, sensory, for example, coming from the body wall. So coming from our skin, uh, our muscles, and our joints, and transmitting that information back to the spinal cord and the brain to be processed. Now the uh, visceral afferents, 
that sensation coming from the body organs because they also have sensations, as you know. So this is going to be uh, stretch and distension and so on, as well as pain. And that's also going to be sent back to the central, uh, to the spinal cord or the brain. We refer to that as the, the visceral. The efferents, these are more the motor portion, right? This is the output coming from the central nervous system. And um, that's giving the commands, right? So for example, we have the somatic motor, which is to skeletal muscle. For example, that's the classic example, right? Um, it can also go to things like glands and so on. Uh, but that would be part of the visceral, excuse me, I jumped in here, but the visceral, the visceral, uh, their efferents, all right, that would go to things like cardiac muscle, smooth muscle, and the glands. Those are all controlled by the visceral. And the visceral efferents are really what we're referring to in the autonomic nervous system. That's really the, the autonomic nervous system, is the uh, visceral efferents, where you're commanding the organs or the glands Right? or I should say the muscles of the organs and the glands to have some sort of output, to contract, to relax, to increase heart rate, to decrease heart rate, um, and so on. So that's, that's what we're really referring to when we talk about the autonomic nervous system. And of course, to contract or relax is carried on or carried out by either the sympathetic or the parasympathetic uh, divisions. All right, so as I've already mentioned, the autonomic nervous system is divided into two parts, the parasympathetic and the sympathetic. The parasympathetic, um, the neurons, these efferent neurons, uh, they come from the what we call the craniosacral regions of the central nervous system. So their neurons originate in cranial nerves 3, 7, 9, and 10. Okay, And uh, the sacral portion of the spinal cord, so S2, 3, and 4 to be specific. So S2, 3, and 4 of the sacral spinal cord, uh, as well as 3, 7, 9, and 10 of the cranial nerves. And so those are the, where the neurons originate for the parasympathetics. And uh, you guys may have heard that the parasympathetics are often referred to as the rest and digest state. So as you guys are in sort of a more relaxed state, the parasympathetic nervous system is usually working. The sympathetic nervous system is referred to as the thoracolumbar because their neurons originate from the thorax and a portion of the lumbar region of the spinal cord. So T1... Uh, you know, T1 through T12 and L1 to about L2 or 3. So again, T1 to about L2 or 3. That's that's the range of it. And so that's where the sympathetic neurons originate. All right, and we'll take a look at that. So I have some images for that. And that's commonly, you know, that uh, fight or flight uh, response. But um, because we always commonly associate sympathetic with fight or flight, I should mention that the sympathetic nervous system is also always working at rest as well. Uh, it's just... Um, not to the extreme level of a fight or flight, but it actually works in concert with parasympathetic to keep things in a balance. And I'll, I'll talk more to that in a little bit. Finally, the enteric nervous system. Um, so this is dealing with the digestive uh, system. And so I'm going to talk more about that during that lecture. But the digestive system is actually uh, what we call semi-autonomous, -autonom meaning it really essentially operates on its own and has a sort of its own reflex loops and so on. Uh, and so it doesn't need much input from the, the CNS, uh, except that the CNS plays a very important role in modulating its activity, and it does that through the autonomic nervous system. So parasympathetic and sympathetic innervates the digestive tract and definitely influences its activity, and it's important that it does so. Uh, but even if we were to disconnect it from there, uh, the stomach would then sort of uh, operate on its own. Or just stomach, but the whole digestive tract would have to operate on its own. Okay, so here is where I just want to show you that there's a very characteristic pattern to the uh, autonomic nervous system. And so one of the, in, in terms of its neurons, there's always two neurons, both in the sympathetic and parasympathetic neurons, it takes two neurons to reach the organ. Okay, so for example, if you had the vagus nerve, cranial nerve 10, uh, when it's leaving, it is the neuron that's actually the cell body that's actually located in the central nervous system, right, within the brain. And then you have that axon goes all the way to, say, uh, the digestive tract. And then on the digestive tract will be located the second neuron, which is located in the peripheral nervous system, the cell body. It'll synapse on that. And that'll have a, an axon that goes to directly to innervate, uh, let's say, the smooth muscle of the digestive tract, for example. Same thing in the sympathetic.
sympathetic is going to have a neuron that's located, let's say, in the spinal cord in the thorax region. Uh, and then that's going to send out an axon into the peripheral, uh, into the periphery, where it's going to synapse on a neuron that's located in the peripheral uh, nervous system in a ganglion, because that's where cell bodies are located. And then that's going to send an axon to the organ. So in other words, it takes two uh, neurons to, to reach the destination. And um, let me see if I can show you here. All right, it's kind of an illustration of that point here. You can see here there's a cross section through the spinal cord. You can see the anterior horn. You'll notice here, just as a reminder, that's the dorsal root ganglion. So that's the dorsal root. Here's the ventral root over here. All right, remember the dorsal root is where sensation, the afferent inputs, are going into the spinal cord. The efferent, or the outputs, all right, would be both the somatic motor, which we've talked about in the previous lectures, but here, you'll notice this, this neuron cell body that's located here, all right, in the anterior horn of the gray matter, uh, or, or also in what we call the lateral horn, which you can't, it's not drawn in this cartoon here, but it's actually located in the lateral horn. I think on a different cartoon, I can show you that. But in any case, you'll notice that it exits anteriorly, so it exits through the anterior root, or the ventral root. All right, so it follows the same motor pattern that we've seen before. Exits that ventral root, and then it travels to a ganglion. Then the ganglion again is a swelling located in the peripheral nervous system, where the neuronal cell bodies are located. So it's going to make a synaptic connection with another neuron, and you can see the cell body is located in that ganglion. And then that's going to release, or it's going to have its axon that leaves that ganglion and innervates the organs, which you can see over here. All right. Now, a couple of things to notice is that the preganglionic, which is the one that has the cell body located in the central nervous system and sends its axon to the ganglion, we call it the preganglionic because it's going to the ganglion, uh, is myelinated. So you can see the little bit of myelin here and here. So it's myelinated. And then you'll, you'll notice that the postganglionic neuron, so the neuron cell body located in the ganglion, which sends its axon uh, out into the organ, is unmyelinated. All right, and that goes directly to the organ. Now this is a, a, an example of a sympathetic, all right, so the sympathetic would release something like norepinephrine to the organ, and I'll come back to that. Here's another example over here, and you'll see again it goes through the anterior, all right, it comes out through the, the ventral or the anterior root. It's myelinated. In this particular example, it's going to the adrenal medulla. So the adrenal glands are located on, on the superior pole of the kidney. And we have a whole lecture designated to that, so we'll get to it. But in the medullary region, or the central portion of that uh, adrenal adrenal gland, all right, it will synapse. And there are specialized cells called chromaffin cells. Now, these chromaffin cells do not have axons. Instead, what happens is when it activates and synapses with these chromaffin cells, they're going to release primarily epinephrine, but also some norepinephrine, directly into the bloodstream. So it'll act more like a hormone. And that can spread you know, everywhere, everywhere there's blood, where the blood goes. This last one is actually an example of the parasympathetic. Again, exits ventrally. You'll notice myelinated preganglionic. It gets to the ganglion. It's when it synapses with the postganglionic neuron. And then that, of course, then uh, will synapse with the organ itself. All right. And in this case, it's releasing acetylcholine. And you'll notice the norepinephrine and the acetylcholine. The norepinephrine is part of the sympathetic. The acetylcholine is part of the parasympathetic, as I mentioned earlier in this lecture. Also, you'll notice that both of them display what we call tonic activity in both divisions. So this is coming back to my point that the, both the parasympathetics and sympathetics will work even at rest uh, to modulate an organ's activity, like modulating heart rate. Sympathetics would increase it, the parasympathetics would, would suppress it or, or reduce it. And so they can act together. And then you get combinations of excitatory and inhibitory actions of the, of the effector cells. And so, um, so they're getting multiple inputs. Uh, but if, let's say, we're going to exercise, sympathetic drive would start to increase and overpower the, the parasympathetic. The parasympathetic might actually reduce. All right. So they'll, they'll, they'll modulate based on the activity. So here, I want to give you a little more detail as far as that preganglionic and postganglionic neurons are concerned. So let's start with the sympathetic nervous system.
I just want to show you sort of the general pattern that you're going to see with the sympathetics. Remember that the sympathetics are the thoracolumbar. So that's coming from the T1 to about the L2 or L3 region of the spinal cord. And there's always two neurons to reach destination. So you have the preganglionic, which is coming from the spinal cord. All right, so I'm just going to draw one of the neurons here. And in fact, you know what? Let me draw it a little bit. We'll draw a little bit shorter there. And then there's the second neuron, which is going to go all the way to the effector cell. So here, I'll draw this circle around this connection here, this synapse, to represent the ganglion. So this, this neuron is coming from the central nervous system. And so what happens is now we have our preganglionic, the pre and then the, this would be this one, the post ganglionic neuron. And so when it reaches that, it goes from the CNS, again, coming from, you know, we'll say T1 to about L3 region. So that's where they originate from. It's going to synapse out in the periphery and specialized ganglia, not the dorsal root ganglia, which I'll, I'll point out. Dorsal root ganglia is, is strictly for afferent neurons, but different types of ganglion. And when it synapses, it's going to release the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. And it's going to release acetylcholine. And of course, down here in the postganglionic neuron, when it when it releases its neurotransmitter onto the cell, it's going to release norepinephrine. And this is going to be the the most common layout that you're going to see. And in fact. This preganglionic is typically short, which is why I redrew it to be a little bit shorter. And the postganglionic is typically much longer than the preganglionic. Now, the other example I gave on the previous slide was that I have my preganglionic. I'm going to draw this one just a little bit longer. And instead of synapsing in a ganglion, I showed you that instead. It was in the adrenal medulla, so the central portion of the adrenal gland, where it synapses on specialized, I'm just going to draw little blue cells there, which are chromaffin cells. And the neurotransmitter that's released by this preganglionic neuron all right, is also acetylcholine. What's released from the chromaffin cells into the bloodstream, so that's my blood vessel, is going to be primarily uh, epi or epinephrine. About 85%, 80 to 85% is going to be epinephrine, as well as um, norepinephrine. Again, it's maybe about 10, 15% or so as and norepinephrine. So that goes directly into the bloodstream. But there's also one exception now. So that, those are the primary ones you're going to see in the sympathetic nervous system, with one exception. And so that exception, I'll draw over here. Again, it's a short preganglionic neuron. Here's the postganglionic neuron, which is longer. So far, it looks the same as our first example. And in fact, the preganglionic is going to release acetylcholine. However, in this example, What's being released down here onto the effector cell is also going to be acetylcholine. And the example for this is strictly for sweat glands. So by far and away, all right, the most common neurotransmitter to be released from the sympathetic postganglionics are going to be norepinephrine. Or if we're talking about the adrenal gland, it's going to be epinephrine with a little bit of norepinephrine. But these are, uh, and they'll activate adrenal receptors. So again, uh, epinephrine is also known as adrenaline. So this is, again, sympathetic stimulation of fight or flight increases adrenaline levels. And that's how it increases it. The only exception to that rule is the sweat glands. Remember, when you're fight or flight, or even if you're exercising, you'll sweat. You're also activating your sympathetic nervous system in this case. The only difference is it's not releasing... Uh, epinephrine or norepinephrine in the postganglionic is releasing acetylcholine.
So it's you know, acetylcholine in this, in this example here. This is the only exception, and it's in the sweat glands. Otherwise, it's very similar. You'll notice some other patterns. All the preganglionics all release acetylcholine. So that's an important other feature. And in fact, they all release acetylcholine. And on the post, all right, so on the, the postganglionic neuron membrane there, the receptor it's going to bind to is the nicotinic acetylcholine uh, receptor. Same thing with the chromaffin cells over here. It's going to be the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. Nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. So in all cases, the preganglionic neurons will all release acetylcholine and the post uh, the postganglionic neurons all contain nicotinic acetylcholine receptors that it'll bind to. And as you might recall, the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors are also found in the neuromuscular junction. And their activity, when the ligand or the acetylcholine binds to it, it opens up an ion channel. So these are very fast acting. They're very quickly reactive. All right, and that'll activate the postganglionics or the chromaffin cells, for example. And that'll release primarily norepinephrine or epinephrine. However, when it comes to sweat glands, it'll release acetylcholine in response to that. Okay, so now what I want to illustrate for you is the parasympathetics. And show you their essentially general layout as well. Again, if you have the preganglionic coming from the central nervous system, they have much longer preganglionic neurons, and then very short postganglionic neurons. I'll draw the ganglion around it again. Okay. And so this again is the pre, this is the postganglionic, and then the effector cell that it's acting on. What's released from the preganglionic is again acetylcholine. So this is making it nice and easy, which will act on nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. And it, the postganglionic is going to release acetylcholine. All right, now the acetylcholine released from the postganglionic is not going to be acting on nicotinic uh, acetylcholine receptors. It's going to be acting on what we call muscarinic acetylcholine receptors. Muscarinic. And this is not an ion channel gated ones, and we'll talk about this a little bit more uh, a little bit later. And again, the, the sort of difference here is first off, in the parasympathetic nervous system, the preganglionics are coming from the craniosacral portions of the central nervous system as opposed to the thoracolumbar. Their preganglionics are longer. In fact, they're so long, usually the preganglionics go all the way to the organ itself, where the ganglion is located. Or in some cases, there may not even be a ganglion at all, but it might actually just synapse on a cell, uh, uh, a postganglionic, if you will, neuron that's located actually on the, on the body of the, the organ itself. So these pre preganglionics are much, much longer. And often, like I said, often extend all the way to the organ itself. Okay, um, and just if you recall, when I said these are craniosacral, just remember the cranial nerves that it comes from are three, seven, nine, and ten. All right, and we're going to come back to that, but these are the ones where they're primarily uh, are, are the cranial, excuse me, are the cranial nerves. Now, I've already kind of mentioned this already, but I'm just going to draw it on the same slide here, but the somatic, all right, the somatic nervous system. So somatic motor, just if you recall, so just a reminder, again, the cell body is located in the, in the spinal cord, all right, in that anterior horn, and that's axon goes all the way to the effector, which in this case would be the skeletal muscle. And at the neuromuscular junction, you guys know it releases acetylcholine onto nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. So again, this is happening at the neuromuscular junction. So I put it there just as a, a point of comparison, which I, in fact, in the next slide, I can show you again.
Okay, so that's what I want to show you here on this slide. It, you can see it, it kind of illustrates some of the things that I've already gone through with you guys. Uh, but here's the autonomic, and you can see sympathetic and parasympathetic. It shows you the one example of the sympathetic that I gave you that was kind of an exception. Uh, because, again, the majority of the sympathetic innervation is going to follow this middle pattern here with a short preganglionic, a longer postganglionic. You'll notice here's the acetylcholine are right, being released, acting on nicotinic receptors on the postganglionic neuron, and then a longer postganglionic that releases norepinephrine. Epinephrine is not released from these postganglionic neurons. In this example, this is again acetylcholine being released onto nicotinic receptors in the adrenal medulla, all right, those chromaffin cells. They're going to release epinephrine and norepinephrine, but primarily epinephrine, uh, and it's going to do that into the blood. In the parasympathetic, you have much longer preganglionics and short postganglionics but it's also releasing acetylcholine onto nicotinic receptors. So it's nice. All three types that you see here all release acetylcholine onto nicotinic receptors. All right, so that makes it easy. However, the parasympathetic is going to release acetylcholine uh, primarily. It's going to act on muscarinic receptors, right? not nicotinic, but muscarinic acetylcholine receptors that are located on the effector cells. Norepinephrine and epinephrine, by the way, I didn't really mention this yet, act on adrenergic receptors on the effector cells. And uh, I'll talk more about them and their subtypes in a little bit. Somatic motor is one that I gave you, that last example that I gave you. There are no ganglia that it synapses on. It, uh, it sends its axon from the, uh, the spinal cord all the way to the skeletal muscle that it innervates, releases acetylcholine onto nicotinic receptors. So this is, you know, you can kind of compare how all these uh, neurotransmitters, uh, you can compare them to each other here. Okay, so here what I'd like to do is kind of take you through at least a logical way to approach uh, how the sympathetic and parasympathetic uh, nervous system function uh, and it changes from like a rest and digest state to a fight or flight. As I've already previously mentioned, uh, keep in mind they're both working at rest, but to varying degrees. So parasympathetic will be more prominent at rest, but if you were to say exercise, sympathetics would then become more prominent. And then... Um, you know, there's gradations of sympathetic outflow. So, for example, if you're doing light duty ex exercise versus very strenuous exercise, there's different amount, different amounts of sympathetic activity that go on. Versus, say, uh, you know, being chased by a bear while you're hiking, that would be you know extreme levels of sympathetic activation. And so we'll kind of talk about that, uh, but also keep in mind that uh, parasympathetic and sympathetic have sort of, for the most part opposite functions of each other on each of the organs. So as I described one, the opposite would be true for the other. So let's take an example. Let's use the extreme example of being chased by a bear. All right, uh, mostly because that's actually happened to me. So it's very close to my heart. So in any case, um, let's say, you know, being chased by the bear, let's think about what your body does in reaction to being chased, all right? So first off, uh, you know, in a rest and digest state, Right? It's okay to have a burger and snack, and maybe if you're watching this video, you're doing that very thing um, if you know, you're not asleep right now. In any case, you know, if a bear comes out and starts charging at you, it's not really time for a burger, right? So you just don't have time to it. You're not thinking about how hungry you are anymore because uh, what happens is your sympathetic nervous system is now really increased its output, all right? And what that does is it's going to shut off your digestive tract, okay? It's going to shut off all the things that are... Uh, accessories to the digestive tract, like your salivary glands. In fact, you may have noticed if you've ever been very nervous, uh, you're, you can get a dry mouth, right? So it can turn off your know, salivary secretions, secretions in the stomach uh, or in the intestines. It can, sh it can basically turn off all those secretions. It can turn off motility in the stomach, so we can't move digestive material throughout. It can close up sphincters, and there's a lot of sphincters in the digestive tract that help to keep you know, food from moving from one portion of the digestive tract to another. So this way it can progress. It, the, in total, what happens is we just turn it off with the sympathetics, okay? Now, at the same time, you know, your heart rate's gonna go up. So your heart rate starts really beating, and that's gonna help move blood through the body. Particularly, we wanna increase blood flow to the skeletal muscle, because again, this is fight or flee, right? So we want skeletal muscle blood flow to increase. So they're going to essentially engorge with blood so that we can, you know, run to capacity or, or to fight if we have to, right, for our life. And so they'll, they'll fill up with blood and get the nutrients and oxygen they need that the blood, is, that the blood has.
again, like I said, we need that oxygen, right, for the muscles. So they'll be working very hard. So the what happens in the lungs is you'll notice that you're probably breathing faster, right? You're breathing faster, you're breathing deeper, and um, your airways are actually going to open up. What happens is the smooth muscles located in your bronchi, all right, they'll actually start to dilate. And dilate means they're going to relax. It's going to increase the diameter of the, those airways. That's going to allow a lot more air to flow into your lungs. That's going to increase the amount of oxygen you can exchange. And so that'll increase the amount of oxygen carrying your blood. And your heart's pumping hard now. It's going to help to move that to the muscles, which are going to need it. Okay? So that's how it's kind of all coordinated. And again, that's turning on those systems while it's turned off the digestive system. It's also turning off things like the, the bladder and the genitalia during high sympathetic output. Okay? Uh, and uh, meanwhile, activating things like the adrenal glands to pump epinephrine throughout your body to get that adrenaline level very high to also help to stimulate some of the organs like the heart and so on. Um, meanwhile, the parasympathetics during the resting stage, all right, that, that would be sort of the opposite. You're going to turn on the digestive system, increase salivation, increase secretions throughout the digestive tract, uh, increase, uh, you know, urination. Uh, it would promote sexual activity, and um, meanwhile, you know, reduce the diameter in the airways. Uh, it would also, you know, reduce your heart rate, reduce the blood flow to the skeletal muscles, and then basically shunt that blood to things like your stomach and so on. Uh, so it kind of turns off and reverses the direction of everything we saw happening in the sympathetic division. All right, so. Again, I, I like to use those as sort of extreme examples because it helps give us an idea. But the sympathetic has graded responses depending on what the stimulus is. So anything from the extreme, which is the example I gave you, to mild exercise. All right, so quickly, just in terms of gradation, if, let's say, the bear chasing me might have got my heart rate up to 120 or 30 or 40 or whatever, it might have gone very fast. Uh, on the other hand, mild exercise may only get it up to, you know, 105 or 110, okay, so that's still sympathetic output, just to a less extent, all right? In terms of its distribution, I've kind of already talked a bit about this already, but I just want to point it out here in the cartoon, is that if this is the, uh, the sympathetic on the left over here, again, we call it thoracolumbar lumbar because it's coming from the thorax, so you'll see that highlight over here, thoracal lumbar, this region right here, and you can see those little, uh, those blue neurons that are exiting there. All right, that would be our preganglionics. There's a couple other things I wanted to point out here, is that from the thoracal lumbar, just outside of the vertebrae, all right, so as the neuron ex exits the spinal cord and exits the vertebrae there, just lateral on either side, all right, on either side of the vertebrae, all right, you have this long chain called the sympathetic chain or the sympathetic trunk. All right, and it spans all the way from the cervical to the sacral region, which you can see here down in the sacrum, down here, all the way to the cervical. And it, again, this is I use this analogy a lot, but beads on a string kind of thing. All right, where you have this chain, and again, it's located bilaterally, so it's on either side. So the left side of the spinal cord would exit into the left chain and the right to the right chain. All of the sympathetic nervous systems, as they leave the, excuse me, all the sympathetic neurons, as they leave their respective level of the spinal cord from T1 to L3, when they exit, they all go into the sympathetic chain. And we call it the sympathetic chain because that's where the sympathetic neurons go, all right? And so I'll talk a bit more about that in the cartoons to come, but they go into that chain first. From there, they could synapse, or they may just go straight through it, but they all go into that chain first. And then they'll have the second, you know, the, the postganglionics, which you can see in red, and they'll go to the organs and, again, uh, increase heart rate and breathing and so on, uh, like we talked about in the previous slide. In the parasympathetic, you'll notice there is no parasympathetic chain at all. It just comes from the cranial region up here and then the sacral region down here, which I've spoken of. And there is no sympathetic chain. So what happens is you have these very long preganglionics, as I've already talked about, that go all the way essentially to the organ where you can see these postganglionics here in purple. All right, you see them all the way there. They essentially go all the way to the organ itself, wherein it uh, you know, synapses on a very small post, we'll call postganglionic neuron there. 
All right. Now you'll notice something here, which I want to point out, is that the cranial region supplies uh, input all the way, all those cranial nerves, all right, supply input all the way to uh, the digestive tract, all the way to the colon, the large intestine. All right. In fact, it's the vagus nerve, or cranial nerve 10, that exits and actually innervates everything you're seeing here from the, the lungs, the heart, the stomach, the pancreas, the liver, all the way to the large intestines. So the vagus nerve is quite extensive. It innervates most of these organs. The only exception is that the sacral portion comes in and takes over what the vagus doesn't reach. The vagus actually reaches all the way to most of the, the large intestine. And then the sacral comes in and takes care of the rest of the intestine as well as some of the pelvic organs and so on from there. But most of this, what you're seeing here, is carried out by that vagus nerve. Okay, so I want to go over a little bit more about the anatomy. I've kind of already talked to you about now uh, preganglionic versus postganglionic, but now I want to put the anatomy in context of that. So how, how, does, how or where does the preganglionic travel? Um, and where does the postganglionic travel? So this is going to hopefully give it, give you a little bit more connection between the anatomy and the preganglionic and postganglionic pathways. So to start, um, what you have here is a section through the spinal cord. We're talking about the sympathetic nervous system, so that's going to be somewhere in the thorax or the lumbar region. And as I mentioned already, the cell body of the preganglionic uh, neuron, its cell body is located in the uh, lateral horn, or what we refer to as the intermedial lateral horn. All right, which is right here. All right, the anterior horn is typically somatic motor. So here we have the lateral horn. And it's going to exit in the same region as the somatic motor, which is going to be the ventral root. As it travels in the ventral root, it's going to become part of the spinal nerve. However, once it joins the spinal nerve, it takes an exit here at the white ramus. We call it the white ramus because the preganglionics all right, are myelinated. And so in anatomy, uh, it looks like it's whitish because of the fatty content of the myelin. And so that's what it does. It joins the spinal nerve and takes a quick exit into the sympathetic chain. So that white ramus is connected to the sympathetic chain, and the white ramus is the input to that sympathetic chain. And as I already mentioned, all sympathetic neurons have to, uh, once they exit the spinal cord, those preganglionics will all enter into that sympathetic chain. And remember, if the neurons are originating from T1 to L3, all right, once it enters the sympathetic chain, the sympathetic chain actually spans all the way from the cervical to the sacral region. So the sympathetic chain is going to essentially act like a highway for those axons to either travel up or down that sympathetic chain. Now, I said the sympathetic chain looks like, you know, beads or pearls on a string. Those pearls or those beads are uh, actually the ganglia. So what you're seeing here is when it enters at this level, so let's say the preganglionic is exiting the um, spinal cord at the level of T1 at the very top. It's going to enter into the sympathetic chain ganglia at the level of T1. Once it's there, though, that axon can divide. Right? And, um, it may divide or may not, but it can divide. And it, can, it can travel up or down that sympathetic chain. And it can synapse on any of the cell bodies that are located in any of the ganglia in that chain. So, for example, if I want to, you know, interact with postganglionic cell bodies that are located in the cervical region, if I'm heading from T1, I have to travel up to the cervical region in order to synapse on those neurons. All right. So again, it, it acts like a, a highway for these these axons to travel in. In the example here, all right, you have you have this particular neuron entering through the white ramus into the sympathetic chain and synapsing immediately, it branches and synapses immediately on a postganglionic neuron, which then exits via the gray ramus and rejoins the spinal nerve over here. It's called gray because the postganglionics are not myelinated. All right, so this helps it to rejoin the spinal nerve. The destination of the spinal nerve is to the cell wall, or excuse me, cell wall, to the, to the body wall, all right? Uh, so it's, it's this going to be innervating, uh, for, for example, um, the blood vessels that go to our body wall, all right, that the blood vessels that go to our skeletal muscle. It's going to be innervating the hairs, okay, the smooth muscle that actually contracts and makes our hair stand up, all right. 
Um, it's also going to be innervating the glands in our skin. So that's what that's doing. It's rejoining the spinal nerve that's going to go to the body wall. Now again, it could divide and go up, which is what you're seeing here, to ganglia that's more superior to it. It can go down to something that's more inferior to it. This is just showing you another joint in the spinal nerve again. Now, in some cases, it may enter into the sympathetic chain and it might go directly through the chain. All right, so this is just a branch coming off of this ganglia here. This is just another nerve here coming off the ganglia. Instead of rejoining the spinal nerve, which is essentially going to the body wall, it's joining what we call a splanchnic nerve. So this is commonly located in things like the uh, abdominal cavity or the pelvic cavity, all right, where this is essentially a nerve coming off of one of the ganglia that's going into the abdominal cavity and it's joining a separate ganglia here. All right, so again, this, this axon traveled through the white ramus into the sympathetic chain because that's where they all go to start. But instead of synapsing on any of the cell bodies or the postganglionic neurons located in the sympathetic chain, it just went through the sympathetic chain via a different nerve to a different ganglion. All right, to a different ganglion. All right, so this is where it found its cell body right there. And then that one, that postganglionic went to one of the digestive organs. That's commonly what you're going to see in the abdominal pelvic region is that it's going to go through the sympathetic chain and synapse in, in one of these other ganglion. And the nerve that connects the sympathetic chain to one of these ganglia in the abdominal cavity are often referred to as splanchnic nerves. So you're going to see the greater splanchnic nerve, the lesser splanchnic nerve, and so on. So that's what's connecting those two together. But it's carrying sympathetic uh, inputs to the digestive tract or to the pelvic organs. All right. Now another term we, we need to be aware of is the fact that we call the ganglia of the sympathetic chain, we refer to them as paravertebral ganglia. That's just the ganglia that are part of the sympathetic chain. Then there is prevertebral ganglia. The prevertebral ganglia are the ganglia that I just circled for you here, ones that are connected to the splanchnic nerves, for example, right here. Prevertebral because it lies anterior in the abdominal cavity, those ganglia lie anterior to the, uh, uh, the vertebrae. Whereas the sympathetic chains are on the lateral side of the vertebrae. We call them paravertebrals. All right. The last thing I want to point out here, and this is, again, this is the sort of the, the basic routes that they can take. So I'm showing you not spe a specific route of any particular sensation or, or excuse me, particular um, pathway, just in general how this, this flow works. The last thing I just want to bring up, since it is in the cartoon here, is the sensory neuron, which is in green. Organs, again, the viscera have sensation as well, like distension, for example. So let's say it's being distended in the gut due to a bolus of food. That sensation can travel backwards through the, uh, these prevertebral ganglia, through the splanchnic nerve, back through the uh, sympathetic chain. Uh, it can travel through the white ramus because these will be myelinated, and then travel through the dorsal root because the dorsal root always carries afferent information, sensations, essentially. And so that's going to go through the dorsal root, just like uh, sensory information from the body wall, like from our skin, would also travel from the spinal nerve back through the dorsal root. Sensory information from the organs would travel, for example, through this path, if, particularly if we're talking about the digestive tract, will travel through the uh, uh, prevertebral, excuse me, through the splanchnics all the way back to the, the spinal cord. It's not synapsing anywhere, it's just using that route to get back. And the cell body is located in that dorsal root ganglion. That dorsal root ganglion is not a sympathetic ganglion, that's simply just the cell bodies for the sensations or for the afferents. Now I have this here so that you guys can actually practice uh, drawing it in yourself. But as just a quick review for you guys, all right, here's the lateral horn. That's where the cell body for the sympathetic neuron would be located. It would exit ventrally, right? This is the axon, so it's exiting ventrally. It's in part of the spinal nerve right now. goes in through the white ramus. And here, it can connect with the post, all right, postganglionic neuron, which, again, can, its path can be 
to go back out to the spinal nerve right or in some cases let me get rid of this in some cases it might just go in through the white and travel up or down the sympathetic chain or it could actually go through the ganglia and connect directly with one of the other nerves and synapse in one of the prevertebral ganglia which could then go to say an effector organ like the digestive tract somewhere okay those prevertebrals may have specific names that you'll see and uh, or you know address more in anatomy like the, the celiac ganglion uh, superior and inferior mesenteric ganglions and so on uh, but these are there's also broadly referred to as prevertebrals these ganglia part of sympathetic, sympathetic chain are called the uh, paravertebral ganglias. So again, you can kind of you know work with that cartoon or draw your own. Uh, since I'm not a very good artist, you could use your own. Uh, I just want to practice those pathways. Okay, so here this is going to give you a little bit more anatomy than I've given you so far uh, in terms of the pathways more specifically because it's showing you the organs and essentially from the sympathetic chain which parts of the sympathetic chain are actually sending postganglionics to a particular organ, okay? So just to kind of give you a quick example, you see here, um, again, we're starting in the T1 to the L2 region, which is where they are originating from. The red are the preganglionics, and they all enter into that sympathetic chain, which again spans from the cervical to the sacral, which acts as, a, again, a highway for the travel of these uh, preganglionics. Now, if we're talking about T1, you'll notice a lot of them, like T1 all the way to about like T3 or so, they travel upwards and synapse in postganglionics in the cervical region. And a lot of the cervical and upper thoracic region innervate things like things from the head, which would be the eye and the heart and lungs, for example. That's where they're coming from. So damage to any part of the chain in the cervical or thoracic region would affect the autonomic inputs to uh, the heart, lungs, and you know, to your eyes. You know, somewhere towards the middle of the region there, you'll, you'll notice the postganglionics. Remember, they, they go to the prevertebral. So you're showing, you're seeing the prevertebrals right here, which I'm circling for you, like the celiac and the superior and inferior mesenteric arteries, which I mentioned before, uh, inferior mesenteric ganglia, excuse me. Postganglionics exit from there and go to the uh, organs located in the abdominal or pelvic region. Okay, so again, the uh, you see here, it travels through the sympathetic chain and forms these nerves right here, which we refer to as splanchnics. All right, so that's that's sort of the basic process. And the last thing I'll just point out here is down here, as it's zooming in, you see the uh, preganglionic in red exit, uh, enters the spinal nerve and then goes through the white ramus to enter into the uh, sympathetic chain where it's synapsed and you see the black postganglionic neuron re-enters the uh, spinal nerve. In that case, when it re-enters the spinal nerve, which is destined for the body wall, it's going to be innervating the blood vessels of the body wall, including blood vessels that go to skeletal muscles, uh, the hair, as well as the glands. The parasympathetic, which is your cranial and your sacral region, again, uh, they do not have a, a chain, so you don't see anything here. Um, Instead, what you have are these very long preganglionics. And as I've already noted, which I won't spend too much time on now, is that the cranial nerve 10, the vagus nerve, uh, you'll notice that that extends from the brain stem and innervates the heart, elevate, innervate portions of the lung as well, the digestive tract, and uh, it goes all the way essentially to the large intestine. So this inside here is the small intestine. Here's the large intestine. It usually goes right to here, which we refer to as like the splenic flexor. Of the large intestine so it doesn't get this last descending portion of the descending colon or the large intestine there and so that's where the sacral region is going to pick up where the vagus stops the sacral portion will pick up the rest of it and get the pelvic organs as well as mentioned dual innervation typically having opposite effects uh, the example I gave already was with the eye Right, so the parasympathetics cause pupillary constriction, sympathetics cause pupil dilation, so sort of an opposite reaction. But you have separate ganglia, so you have a superior cervical ganglia from the sympathetic chain, which is actually causing the, uh, the or giving the sympathetic input, causing dilation. 
and then the ciliary ganglia, which is the specific parasympathetic ganglion, which is going to cause constriction. All right, so again, coming from two different locations, you can see here, sympathetic coming from the thorax, thorax region, region. Coming a little aphasic, sorry. Then over here, the blue, the blue region, which is coming from the brain stem there, from one of our cranial nerves. Now, here, what's really key to this slide is not so much memorizing this pathway for the eye, because I'm not going to test you on that, okay? But more or less to, uh, to really kind of push on you that there are these exceptions to, the, to this rule of dual innervation. The majority will have it, okay? We'll have both sympathetic and parasympathetic inputs. However, the adrenal glands only have sympathetic input so that they can release adrenaline, which is not what the parasympathetic does. So it's the only sympathetic input. Sweat glands, only sympathetic input. And the vascular smooth muscle, and I underline that one, okay, the vascular smooth muscle. So again, in our blood vessels, the smooth muscles that line our blood vessels have only sympathetic innervation. There is no parasympathetic innervation. Now that doesn't mean it can only constrict. Blood vessels can dilate as well, but it's not doing it because of parasympathetic input. It's doing it because of some other mediator or a lessening of the sympathetic input. So in other words, to maintain our blood pressure, it maintains a certain amount of sympathetic, what we call tone or activity at all times. And if we lessen the amount of activity, the blood vessels will dilate as the smooth muscles relax. If we increase its activity, they'll constrict more. So we're really just modulating the amount of sympathetic activity going on. We're not you know, influencing it with parasympathetics. The neurotransmitters, we've kind of talked about a little bit already, but uh, cholinergic refers to acetylcholine. So they have cholinergic receptors. So as mentioned before, where we saw nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, which are found in all the uh, postganglionic membranes, all right? And uh, they have a, an ion channel, so they're very quick acting. Then they have the muscarinic, which are actually located on the organ itself. Muscarinic uh, have a second messenger activity. So it's going to have a, a cascade of events, all right? Uh, increasing cyclic AMP or IP3 or something like that. Adrenergic, so that's referring to norepinephrine and epinephrine, which again is essentially uh, noradrenaline or adrenaline. We also refer to the group of these compounds, norepinephrine, epinephrine, as well as dopamine, uh, as catecholamines because they're all uh, based on the same structure with just different enzymes to create one or another. So norepinephrine is, uh, if you modify it, it can become epinephrine, right? So these are the adrenergic, they're going to have adrenergic receptors. So I mentioned that before, but there are subtypes, all right? The two subtypes broadly are alpha and beta subtypes. The alpha and beta both have second messenger systems. So these are not ion channels or second messenger systems. This is just to point out how we have to remove these, these neurotransmitters. So for example, acetylcholine, as, you, as I've mentioned before, is actually broken down by acetylcholinesterase. So that degrades it uh, in the synaptic cleft, and then it can be recycled, for example. Norepinephrine, uh, released from the neurons, uh, it can be broken down by monoamine oxidase, or shortened to MAO, or catechol or methyltransferase, COMT. And that can be located peripherally in the tissue. So when it's released, that can be broken down by those tissues. But norepinephrine, as well as epinephrine, is broken down by the same enzymes. Uh, those two uh, are commonly taken care of most uh, predominantly by the liver. So the liver contains things like uh, catechol, methyltransferases, and so on to help break down uh, excess levels of norepinephrine and, and epinephrine. Okay, uh, what you're seeing here to the left in the, in the drawing are just some examples again of things that I've kind of already gone over. So you see the parasympathetics uh, primarily releasing acetylcholine and acetylcholine again. You see the receptor types which we've gone over. The sympathetics, you see again the acetylcholine and the receptor type, norepinephrine and, the, and it's adrenergic. Uh, here was that classic example of a sympathetic cholinergic fiber where it releases acetylcholine instead of norepinephrine or uh, where it releases acetylcholine excuse me instead of norepinephrine and acts on a muscarinic receptor uh, that's as you guys know from the previous examples is referring to the sweat gland that's what the target cell is all right so the adrenergic receptors so let's just break down those subtypes a little bit so we have uh, alpha 1 alpha 2 beta 1 and beta 2 
And uh, what's useful to know is their distribution and what their primary functions are in that organ. And you'll basically understand what's going to happen. If you remember logically what happens during the fight or flight response, you'll have an understanding of essentially what these, these receptors are doing. So as an example, let's take alpha-1. So alpha-1 is located in most vascular smooth muscle. So in the blood vessel walls, you have a lot of alpha-1 receptors. And so what happens is when, uh, say, norepinephrine or epinephrine binds to it, it's going to cause the smooth muscle to contract, which is going to cause constriction because it's located in a sort of a circumferential pattern. So it constricts. That's going to reduce flow downstream. So it causes constriction of those vessels. Um, you can also see alpha-1s on you know, the smooth muscles of other organs. And that could cause constriction or, or, or to dilate. It just it depends on the cell type. Uh, it depends on the organ, I should say. And in this case, I say epinephrine and norepinephrine will act on alpha-1s approximately the same, with the same efficacy or affinity. Alpha-2. The alpha-2 is actually located on the, the presynaptic neuron uh, in the synapse there. It, what happens is, is that neuron is releasing, say, norepinephrine. When it releases norepinephrine onto the cell to, say, cause constriction or something like that, as there's a, an increase in, in norepinephrine in the synaptic cleft, that can act on the alpha-2s. And the alpha-2 just basically tells the presynapse, which is releasing the norepinephrine, to turn it off. It's a negative feedback, so stop releasing it. And that helps to uh, reduce the amount of stimulation that's occurring and can ultimately help with vasodilation. Uh, and by vasodilation, I mean, again, uh, relax the smooth muscle in the blood vessel wall to open up again. Okay, so it, it helps to sort of maintain and not release too much norepinephrine. Beta 1 and beta 2. So beta 1 are primarily located in the heart, which is very useful to know. All right. Uh, and so this, when you activate the beta 1s, that's going to increase heart rate and contractility, or the force with which it contracts. Epinephrine and norepinephrine, again, act equally on this particular receptor. Uh, beta 2. Beta 2 is located in smooth muscles of the respiratory uh, pathways, so the bronchioles, for example. The uterine smooth muscles, GI smooth muscles, uh, skeletal, uh, skeletal muscle blood vessels. So before I said alpha 1 is on most of the vascular smooth muscle. Beta 2, this is kind of important, beta 2 uh, is in high concentration. It's skeletal muscle uh, blood vessel smooth, smooth muscle. So basically, the blood vessels that feed the skeletal muscles, those smooth muscles that line those blood vessels have a lot of beta 2s. And so this allows, you know, if for an increase in sympathetic activity where epinephrine and norepinephrine levels are rising, it allows those blood vessels to dilate, to increase blood flow to that skeletal muscle. So it's going to cause them to relax. In this case, in beta 2, and this one's an important exception, beta 2 epinephrine all right, has a higher affinity and efficacy at the beta 2 than norepinephrine. So epinephrine works better than norepinephrine at beta 2. So in this case, epinephrine would bind to beta 2, and in the respiratory, path, uh, in the respiratory tract, that would cause opening up of the airways so we can increase that breathing. Okay? Uh, the, in the GI smooth muscles, it would cause you know, sort of a shutting down, if you will. All right, just to kind of give some examples for you. Down at the bottom, this is also from your notes, uh, epinephrine and norepinephrine, but I also put isoproterenol, which is actually a compound that used to be used for asthma, for example. And what this is really kind of pointing out is that there's two really important features of having these subtypes of adrenergic receptors. Is one, having these subtypes means that we can hopefully design drugs, for example, to target specific parts of the body without affecting others based on what we're trying to accomplish. So for example, if you're trying to open up the airway so somebody can breathe who's an asthmatic because they, those airways can close or constrict, then giving somebody with a beta-2 agonist, something that activates the beta-2, well, if you activate the beta-2 in the airway, it's going to open it up, it's going to relax, it's going to cause dilation there. And so that can be a very, very useful feature for that kind of medication. On the other hand, if somebody has a very high heart rate and I want to bring it down, I might use a beta blocker. What we're referring to is a beta-1 blocker, something that's going to antagonize that beta receptor so that epinephrine and norepinephrine can't interact with it as readily, and that's going to help bring the heart rate down. And it's going to, you know, target the heart specifically because it's got beta-1 receptors, something that, you know, the drug is looking for.
So this helps us to actually treat patients as having this difference in receptor subtypes, things that we can actually target. Um, now here, what it's showing you at the bottom there is that uh, if I had an alpha receptor, any of the alpha receptors, like alpha-1 primarily is what we're talking about, uh, epinephrine and norepinephrine will activate it, no problem. Isoproterenol, this drug would not actually have any action on alpha receptors whatsoever. Beta-1s and beta-2s, uh, you'll notice that epinephrine and norepinephrine can act on beta-1 the same. Isoproterenol can also act on it. Over here, the beta-2 epinephrine can act on it, but norepinephrine cannot, so that's an X right there. Isoproterenol can. So isoproterenol is a drug that targets beta-1 and beta-2. Okay, used to be a drug that was used in, in asthma. And uh, norepinephrine doesn't really have much action on beta-2. So a classic example for, um, for the lack of action on beta-2 with norepinephrine is if somebody says in, you know, having anaphylaxis or an anaphylactic shock, they, their airways start to close, right? So in response to whatever, a peanut allergy or something like that, you see their airways start to close, they can't breathe. And uh, so one of the, you know, one of the things they carry with them is an EpiPen. So Epi is short for epinephrine. So they give themselves the Epi, and the, what the epinephrine is actually doing is it's binding to the beta-2 receptors in the airways, and it causes relaxation of the smooth muscles in the airways, and it opens it up so that they can breathe again. So that's why they use it emergently. It acts very quickly, and it uh, can be life-saving. Now, we don't usually give norepinephrine in those situations because norepinephrine doesn't act on beta-2s, which is the primary receptor located in the airway smooth muscles. So it wouldn't have as, as, as good an effect, right? So that's why we use an EpiPen, not a norepinephrine. Uh, Here's some further examples that are actually from your notes. Uh, if we look at this, this is the parasympathetics. Just as an example, uh, again, this is going to be acetylcholine acting on muscarinic acetylcholine receptors. In the heart, all right, that'll reduce the heart rate. Okay, blood vessels. If you recall, there is no parasympathetic input to the blood vessels, so nothing would happen there. There's no influence. In the respiratory passageways, it causes constriction. All right, in the GI, it's going to cause an increase in contraction or an increase in activity because that's what parasympathetics do, right? Rest and digest is going to increase secretions and, the, and motor activity of the digestive tract. If you wanted to block that activity, you could give atropine. Atropine is a well-known drug that inhibits muscarinic acetylcholine receptors and so therefore blocks parasympathetic activity wherever there's muscarinic acetylcholine receptors. Now over here, we have our sympathetic division. And so you can see the adrenergic receptors, the different types. We have alpha, so that's going to be primarily alpha 1, which is being demonstrated there. Alpha 1, beta 1s, and beta 2s. So let's take a look at the alpha. In the heart, there are no alpha receptors in the heart muscles. All right, so it doesn't have any effect. It is found in abundance in many of the blood vessels, and it causes vasoconstriction. There are none in the respiratory passageway, so nothing happens there. In the GI, it causes relaxation. It can cause relaxation of the muscles there, so it's not moving food through the digestive tract. It's also to be noted that alpha can be found in the sphincters, so it can cause contraction there. So that prevents the movement of food from one portion of the digestive tract to the other, effectively shutting it down. Beta, uh, the beta two here is, um, excuse me, yeah, beta two here is not found in the heart. All right, in the blood vessels causes vasodilation, primarily in the skeletal muscle blood vessels that I talked about. Respiratory passageways, it dilates them, okay? The GI smooth, uh, smooth muscle can also cause relaxation there as well to help inhibit uh, the digestive uh, tract during sympathetic output. Beta-1, as you know, that's primarily uh, located in the heart, so it only has an effect on the heart, increased heart rate and contra contractility with really no effect on some of these other systems here. And then down here, it's just showing you some of the drugs that can actually block the agents that I just talked about. So for alpha receptors, the zosins, I call them, all right, the prezosins, the doxazosins, these are ones that block the alpha-1 receptor and can prevent these effects. Uh, propanolol, so the olols, propanolol, uh, metoprolol, these are all ones that will have various uh, efficacies at the beta-1 or beta-2 receptors, but they're beta blockers, all right?
Then again, you know, you'll learn this more in pharmacology, which drugs to use for what, which particular conditions. Okay, so this last slide, I just wanted to touch on sort of a, a clinical correlation here. Um, so an example here would be Horner's syndrome. And so the classic triad of Horner's syndrome, clinically speaking, is what we have, what we call ptosis, which is a, a drooping of the eyelid on one side. You can compare that to the other eye over there. And then you see meiosis. And meiosis uh, is actually a constriction of the pupil. And the last part of the triad is also something called anhydrosis. Anhydrosis uh, just means the lack of sweating on the one side of the face there. Uh, I can't really show that in picture form easily. So really what we're just going to see is the ptosis and the meiosis. But the triad would include anhydrosis. And of course, we're going to compare it to the other eye. And you can see how the, the eyelid is drooping. You can see how the pupil is constricted compared to the other one. Now, how does this relate to an autonomic nervous system issue? Well, first off, um, if you recall, most organs have dual innervation, with the few exceptions that I told you guys about. The eye is one of them that has dual innervation, right? So um, it has parasympathetic and sympathetic. Now, you can imagine that I have dual innervation. They're both kind of working together, right? But if I were to turn one off, like one of them, parasympathetic or the sympathetic, then the other one would take over, right? There's, there's nothing to, uh, to prevent it. There's no antagonistic effect. So in this example, if I have a patient who has meiosis or a constricted pupil, if you recall, the parasympathetic portion of the nervous system causes that constriction. So if I have primarily constriction going on, that must mean that there's something wrong with the sympathetic. The sympathetic is might be turned off here. So somehow the sympathetic is impaired because the parasympathetic is causing constriction without any, uh, you know, any resistance from the sympathetic nervous system. And of course, when I look at the pupil, I always have to check the other side as well. I have to check over here. You'll notice that the pupil is, is much larger there. There's a difference between the sides, and that should never be. If the left side were to constrict, then the right side would constrict as well. And you can test this theory out yourself by shining a light only, you can cover this, your, your face like this so you, know, you don't affect the one eye. Shine a light into the right eye and take a look what happens to the left. It's the same thing. The left will constrict. So it'll always be, they should always be equal. Here you can see they're clearly not. And you also see the drooping eyelid, which is, the, you know, again, another one of the findings. Now, I'm not talking about a drooping eyelid that, of course, some people have genetically or that some people can get once in a while if uh, they're drinking too much. Okay. That's not the type of droop that I'm talking about. I mean, that is a, a form of ptosis. But this, this has to go with the triad here, all right? Take a look at the pupil and then take a look at this, this ptosis. Uh, the ptosis, what happens is the drooping of the eyelid. That eyelid is actually helped prop, being kept propped up and wider uh, and open, excuse me, due to smooth muscle action, all right? Uh, not just skeletal, it's actually some smooth muscle there. And that smooth muscle is activated by the sympathetic nervous system to help keep your eyes open wider. Which makes sense if you think about it in terms of the sympathetic and what's happening here. We want to open up our eyes nice and wide, dilate our pupils, let in as much light as possible. Uh, this could help in a fight or flight situation. But here you can see that that's now drooped. The lack of sweating. Remember, sympathetics cause sweating. So there's the lack of sweating. So that's also an indication that something is wrong with the sympathetic nervous system. So in this case, in Horner syndrome, what happens is you can see from this cartoon here on the drawing, all right, from Netters. Netters is great for anatomy, all right. Over here, I'll just draw this over here. I circled this. So this person had a, a what they call a pancos tumor, which is in the apex of the lung, and the apex of the lung actually ascends even above the clavicle region there. But in this region, there is a lot of different anatomical structures that you guys are learning about. All right. Uh, some of the anatomical structures that are found there are the uh, sympathetic chain. So the cervical ganglia of the sympathetic chain would be located in that region. So some of the output coming from that, uh, those uh, sympathetic chain ganglia carry sympathetic inputs to the eyeball. So that would be impinged. And so that can cause you know, drooping of the eyelid and you know, constriction of the pupil, uh, as well as the anhydrosis. And you'll notice in, the, in the, the same cartoon, the guy's holding his left arm, he's got some, you know, or his right arm, he's got some right arm uh, extremity weakness because, you, you know, you, you also have the brachial plexus, which is traveling through there. And so he may have some nerve damage or impingement of the nerve, which helps, you know, the motor activity of his extremity.
so this you know pancos tumor uh, you're seeing these signs of ptosis meiosis and anhydrosis which would be you know a sign that you should look into saying I take a chest x-ray of the lungs or something like that but he may have some damage due to this little region right here above the clavicle causing impingement of the nerves that are traveling through that region leading to obstruction of sympathetic output as well as maybe some obstruction of things like the brachial plexus and the picture of a cat is just a picture of a cat it's uh, you can just see that uh, the cat has meiosis here in one of the eyes there this is kind of a, a demonstration of I guess what it would look like in a cat but when I typed in Horner syndrome the first picture that came up was a picture of a cat so anyway enjoy that and I will talk to you guys uh, in zoom and answer any questions that you guys have take care and good luck